But Odysseus himself left the harbor and ascended a rugged path through wooded country along the heights where Athene had indicated the noble swineherd who beyond others cared for the house properties acquired by noble Odysseus. He found him sitting in front on the porch where the lofty enclosure had been built in a place with a view on all sides, both large and handsome, cleared all about, and it was the swineherd himself who had built it to hold the pigs of his absent master, far from his mistress and far from aged Laertes. He made it with stones from the field and topped it off with shrubbery. Outside he had driven posts in a full circle to close it on all sides, set close together and thick, the dark of the oak split out from the logs. Inside the enclosure he made twelve pig pens next to each other for his sows to sleep in, and each of them fifty pigs who sleep on the ground were confined. These were the breeding females, but the males lay outside, and these were fewer by far, for the godlike suitors kept diminishing their numbers by eating them since the swineherd kept having to send them in the best of all the well-fattened porkers at any time. Now they numbered three hundred and sixty, and four dogs, who were like wild beasts, forever were lying by them. These the swineherd, leader of men, had raised up himself. Now he was fitting sandals to his feet, cutting out a well-colored piece of oxide. Meanwhile, the other swineherds were out with a herd of pigs one place or another, three of them, but the fourth he had sent off to the city to take a pig to the insolent suitors since they so forced him so they could sacrifice it and glut their appetites on it. Suddenly, the wild baying dogs caught sight of Odysseus. They ran at him with a great outcry, and Odysseus prudently sat down on the ground, and the staff fell out of his hand. But there beside his own steading, he might have endured a shameful mauling, but the swineherd, quick and light on his feet, came hurrying to him across the porch and let fall from his hand the shoe he was holding. He shouted at the dogs and scared them in every direction with volleyed showers of stones and spoke then to his own master. Old sir, the dogs were suddenly on you and would have savaged you badly, so you would have covered me with shame, but already there are other pains and sorrows the gods have bestowed upon me. For here I sit, mourning and grieving away for a godlike master, and carefully raise his fattened pigs for others to eat, while he, in need of finding some sustenance, wanders some city or countryside of alien-speaking people, if he is still alive somewhere and looks on the sunlight. Come, old sir, along to my shelter, so that you also first may be filled to contentment with food and wine. Then tell me where you come from, and about the sorrows you have been suffering." So spoke the noble swineherd, and led the way to the shelter, and brought him in, and seated him on brushwood piled up beneath, and spread over this the hide of a hairy wild goat from his own bed. This was great and thick, and Odysseus was happy at how he received him, and spoke a word and named, to, named him, saying, May Zeus, stranger, and the other gods everlasting grant you all you desire the most, for you have received me heartily. Then, O swineherd, Umaeus, you said to him in answer, Stranger, I have no right to deny this stranger, not even if one came to me who was meaner than you. All vagabonds and strangers are under Zeus, and the gift is a light and a dear one that comes from us. For that is the way of us who are servants and forever filled with fear when they come under power of masters who are new. The gods have stopped the homeward voyage of that one who cared greatly for me, and granted me such possessions as a good-natured lord grants to the thrall of his house, a home of his own, and a plot of land, and a wife much sought after, when the man accomplishes much work, and God speeds the labor, as he has sped for me this labor to which I am given. So my lord would have done much for me if he had grown old here, but he perished, as I wish Helen's seed could all have perished, pitched away, for she was unstrung the knees of so many men. For an Agamemnon's cause my master went also to Ilion, land of good horses, there to fight with the Trojans. He spoke, and pulled his tunic to with his belt, and went out swiftly to his pig pens, where his herd of swine were pinned in, and picked out a pair, and brought them in, and sacrificed them, and singed them, and cut them into little pieces, and spitted them, then roasted all, and brought it, and set it before Odysseus, hot on the spits as it was, and sprinkled white barley over it, and mixed the wine as sweet as honey in a bowl of ivy, and himself sat down facing him, and urged him on, saying, Eat now, stranger, what we serving men are permitted to eat young pigs, but the fattened swine are devoted by, by, devoured by the suitors, who have no regard for anyone in their minds, no pity. The blessed gods have no love for a pitiless action, but rather they reward justice, and what do men what men do that is, is lawful. And though those are hateful and lawless men who land on an alien shore, 
and Zeus grants them spoil and plunder when they have loaded their ships with it, they set sail away for home. For even in the minds of these there is stored some fear, which is stronger than on these there falls strong fear of how they may be regarded. But the suitors, you see, have heard some God-sent rumor, and they know about the dismal death of our man, and they will not decently make their suit, nor go home to their own houses, but at their ease they forcibly eat up his property and spare nothing. For as many as are the nights and days from Zeus, on not one of these do they dedicate only a single victim, nor only two, and they violently draw the wine and taste it. See now, he had an endlessly abundant livelihood. Not one of the heroes over on the black mainland had so much. No one here in Ithaca, no twenty men together had such quantity of substance as he. I will count it for you. Twelve herds of cattle on the mainland, as many sheep flocks, as many troops of pigs, and again as many wild goat flocks, and friends over there and his own herdsmen pasture them for him. And here again at the end of the island, eleven wide flocks of goats in all are pastured. Good men have these in their keeping. And day by day, each of these people brings in for the suitors a sheep, and each brings in the fatted goat that seems finest. And I myself keep watch on these pigs and guard them, and I too choose with care the best of the pigs and send it off to them. He spoke, and the other ate his meat and drank his wine quietly, greedily, and without speaking, and devised evils for the suitors. But when he had dined and filled a desire with food, the other filled the cup in which he was drinking and handed it to him, all filled with wine, and he received it. And his heart was cheered, and he spoke to him then, and addressed him in winged words, saying, Dear friend, who is the man who bought you with his possessions, and is so rich and powerful as you tell me? You say he was one who perished in Agamemnon's cause. Then tell me, and perhaps I might know him, if he was such a man. For Zeus knows, as do the other immortal gods, if I might have seen him, and have some report to give you. I have wandered to many places. Then the swineherd, leader of men, said to him in answer, Hold, sir, there is none who could come here, bringing a report of him, and persuade his wife and his dear son. And yet there are vain and vagabond men in need of sustenance, who tell lies, and are unwilling to give a true story. And any vagrant who makes his way to the land of Ithaca goes to my mistress, and babbles his lies to her. And she then receives him well, and entertains him, and asks him everything. And as she mourns him, the tears run down from her eyes, since this is the right way for a wife when her husband is far and perished. So you too, old sir might spin out a well-made story if someone would give you a cloak or tunic to wear for it. But for him, the dogs and the flying birds must be, by now have worried the skin away from his bones, and the soul has left them, or else the fish have eaten them out in the great sea, and his bones lie now on the mainland shore with the sand piled deeply upon them. So he has perished there, and sorrows are made for his dear ones all hereafter, and me most of all, for never again now will I find again a lord as kind as he wherever I go. Even if I could go back to my father and mother's house where first I was born, and they raised me when I was little. But I do not so much mourn for this, much though my longing is to behold them with these eyes in my own country. But the longing is on me for Odysseus, and he is gone from me. And even when he is not here, my friend, I feel some modesty about naming him. For in his heart he cared for me greatly and loved me. So I call him my master, though he is absent." Then long-suffering, great Odysseus spoke to him in answer. Dear friend, since you are altogether full of denial, you do not think he will come, and your heart is ever entrusting. But I will not speak in the same manner, but on my oath tell you, Odysseus is on his way home. Let me have my reward for good news, then, as soon as he has come back and enters his own house. Give me fine clothing, a cloak and tunic to wear. Before that much as I stand in need of these, I would not accept them. For as I detest the doorways of death, I detest that man who under constraint of poverty babbles beguiling falsehoods. Zeus be my witness, first of the gods and the table of friendship, and the hearth of blameless Odysseus, to which I come as a su suppliant. All these things are being accomplished in the way I tell them. Sometime within this very year Odysseus will be here, either at the waning of the moon or at its onset. He will come home and take his vengeance here upon any who deprives his wife and his glorious son of their due honor. Then, O swineherd Eumaeus said to him in answer, Old sir, I will never pay you that gift for good news, nor will Odysseus come to this house again. Be easy and drink your wine. We will think of other matters. Do not then keep on reminding me of this, for the heart within me grieves whenever anyone speaks of my gracious master. So we will let your oath alone. 
but I hope that Odysseus will come back, as I wish, and as Penelope wishes, and Laertes the old man too, and gone like Telemachus. But now I grieve unforgettingly for Telemachus, the son born to Odysseus. The god made him grow like a young tree, and I thought he would be among the men one not inferior to his dear father, admirable for build and beauty. But some immortal upset the balanced mind within him, or else it was some, some men. He went after news of his father to Pylos, the sacrosanct, and the haughty suitors are lying in wait for him as he comes home, to make Artacasios stock and seed perish all away and be nameless in Ithaca. Now we will let him be, however, whether they catch him or whether he escapes, and the son of Cronos protects him. But come now, aged sir, recite me the tale of your sorrows, and tell me this too, tell me truly so that I may know it. What man are you and whence? Where is your city, your parents? What kind of ship did you come here on? And how did the sailors bring you to Ithaca? What men do you claim that they are? For I do not think you could have traveled on foot to this country. Then, resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, See, I will accurately answer all that you ask me. I only wish there were food enough for the time, for us too, and sweet wine for us here inside of the shelter, so that we could feast quietly while others tend the work. Then easily I could go on for the whole of a year and still not finish a story of my harsh tribulations. <laughs> all that hard work I have done in my time because the gods willed it. I announced that my origin is from Crete, a spacious land. I am son of a rich man, and there were many other sons who were born to him and reared in his palace. These were lawful sons by his wife, but a bought woman, a concubine, was my mother. Yet I was favored with the legitimate sons by Castor, Hylicus' son, whom I claim as father. Honored among the Cretans in the countryside as a god is, in those days for wealth and power and glorious children. But then, you see, the death spirits caught and carried him from us to the house of Hades, and his overbearing sons divided the livelihood among them and cast lots for it. Little enough, however, was what they gave me in goods and houses, but I took for myself a wife from people with many possessions because of my courage, for I was no contemptible man, not one who fled from the fighting, but now all that has gone from me, but still I think, if you look at the stubble, you see what the corn was like when it grew. But since then, hardship enough has had me. Ares and Athene endowed me with courage, that power that breaks men in battle. Whenever I detailed the best fighters to go into ambush, planning evil things for the enemy, the proud heart of me had no image of death before it. But far the first, <clears throat> I would leap out and with my spear bring down that enemy whose speed of foot failed him against me. Such was I in the fighting, but labor was never dear to me, nor care for my house, though that it is what raises glorious children. But ships that are driven on by oars were dear to me always, and the wars and throwing spears with polished hafts, and the arrows, gloomy things which to other men are terrible, and yet those things were dear to me, which surely some god had put there in my heart, for the different men take action in different actions, take joy in different actions. Before the sons of the Achaeans embarked for Troy, I was nine times a leader of men, and went in fast-faring vessels against outland men, and much substance came my way, and from this I took out an abundance of things, but much I allotted again, and soon my house grew greater, and from that time on I went among the Cretans as one feared and respected. But when Zeus of the wide brows devised for us that hateful expedition, which unstrung the knees of so many men, they were urgent upon me and renowned Odominius to lead with the ships to Ilion, and there was no remedy, nor any refusing, for the hard speech of that people constrained us. Then for nine years we sons of Achaeans fought there, and in the tenth we sacked the city of Priam, and went back homeward with our ships, and the gods scattered the Achaeans, but for wretched me Zeus of the councils devised more hardships. One month only I stayed, taking pleasure in my children and my wedded wife and my possessions, but then the spirit within me urged me to take an expedition to Egypt, with ships well appointed, and with my godlike companions. I appointed nine ships, and rapidly the people were gathered, and for six days then my eager companions, companions continued feasting, but I provided them with abundant victims for sacrifice to the gods, and for themselves to make ready their feast. On the seventh day we went aboard, and from wide Crete sailed on a north wind that was favorable and fair. It was easy, like sailing downstream, so that never a single one of my ships was hurt, and we, unharmed, without sickness, sat still, and let the wind and steersmen hold them steady. On the fifth day we reached the abundant stream of Icaptos, 
and I stayed my oar-swept ships inside the Agapetos River. Then I urged my eager companions to stay where they were, there close to the fleet, and to guard the ships, and was urgent with them to send lookouts to the watching places. But they, following their own impulse and giving way to marauding violence, suddenly began plundering the Egyptians' beautiful fields, and carried off the women and innocent children, and killed the men, and soon the outcry came to the city. They heard the shouting, and at the time when dawn shows, they came on us, and all the plain was filled with horses and infantry and the glare of bronze, and Zeus, who delights in thunder, flung down a foul panic among my companions, and none was so hardy as to stand and fight, for the evil stood in a circle around them. There they killed many of us with sharp bronze, and others they led away alive to work for them in forced labor. <laughs> but Zeus himself put this thought into my mind, as I will tell you. But how I wish I had died and set my destiny there in Egypt, for there was still more sorrow awaiting me. At once I put the well-wrought helm from my head, the great shield off my shoulders, and from my hand I let the spear drop, and went out into the way of the king and up to his chariot, and kissed his knees and clasped them. He rescued me and took pity and seated me in his chariot and took me, weeping homeward with him. And indeed many swept in on me with ash spears, straining to kill me, for they were all too angered. But the king held them off from me, and honored the anger of Zeus' protector of strangers, who beyond others is outright at evil dealings. There, for seven years, I stayed and gathered together more substance from the men of Egypt, for all gave to me. But when in the turning of time the eighth year had befallen me, then there came a Phoenician man, well skilled in beguilements, a gnar at others' goods, and many were the hurts he inflicted on men, and by his wits talked me over. So I went with him to Phoenicia, where lay this man's house and possessions. There, for the fulfillment of a year, I stayed with him. But when the months and when the days had come to completion, when the circling back of the year again, the seasons came on, then he took me on his seafaring ship to Libya, with lying advices that with him we could win a cargo, but in fact, so he could sell me there and take the immense price for me. I went with him on his ship, forced to, although I suspected all, on a north wind that was favorable and fair above in the, the middle of Crete, but Zeus was plotting these men's destruction. But after we had left Crete behind us, and there was no more land in sight, but only the sky and the sea, the Cronian Zeus drew on a black, blue-black cloud and settled it over the hollow ship, and the open sea was darkened beneath it. Zeus, with thunder and lightning together, crashed on our vessel, and struck by the thunderbolt of Zeus, she spun in a circle, and all was full of brimstone. The men were thrown in the water, and bobbing like sea crows, they were washed away on the running waves all around the black ship, and the god took away their homecoming. But Zeus himself, though I had pain in my heart, then put into my hands the giant mass of the ship with dark prows, so that I could still escape the evil. <coughs> and I, embracing this, was swept along before the destructive storm winds. Nine days I was swept along, and on the tenth, in black night, the great wave rolling washed me up on the shore, and Thos Thesprosia sorry, and washed me up on the shore of Thesprosia. There the king of the Thesprosians and hero of Phaedon looked after me without price, for his own dear son had come on me when I was beaten by weariness and cold air, and lifted me up by, by the hands, and led me home to the house of his father, and put a mantle and tunic about me to wear his clothing. It was there I, I had word of Odysseus, for this king told me he had feasted and friended him on his way back to his own country, and he showed me all the possessions gathered in by Odysseus, bronze and gold and difficultly, difficultly wrought iron. Truly, that would feed a succession of heirs to the tenth generation. Such are the treasures stored for him in the house of the great king. But he said Odysseus had gone to Dodona to listen to the will of Zeus, only the holy deep-leaved oak tree, out of the holy deep-leaved oak tree, out of the holy deep-leaved oak tree. For how he could come back to the rich countryside of Ithaca in secret or openly, having been by now long absent. And he swore to me my presence, as he poured out a libation in this house, that the ship was drawn down to the sea and the crew were ready to carry Odysseus back again to his dear own dear country. But before that he sent me off for a ship of Thesprosian men and happened then to be sailing for Dulucian, rich in wheat fields. So he urged them to convey me there to King Acastos in a proper way. But their hearts were taken with a bad counsel concerning me, so I still should have the pain of affliction. 
So when the seafaring ship had gone far out from the mainland, they presently devised a day of slavery for me. They took off the took off me the mantle and tunic I wore as clothing, and then they put another vile rag on me and a tunic tattered, the one you yourself see with your eyes. At evening time they made their way off the fields of sunny Ithaca, and there they tied me fast in the strong bent ship, with the ropes in twisted and tightly about me, and themselves disembarking speedily took their evening meals on the sand of the seashore. <clears throat> but the very gods themselves untied the knots that were on me easily, and I, wrapping my head in a rag, climbed down the polished plank that was there for loading, and let my chest into the sea, then stuck, struck out with my both and then struck out with both my arms, and thus swimming I was very soon out of the water and close to where they were. Then I went up, where there was a growth of flowering thicket, and lay there, cowering. They, with outcry, great and sorrowful, came back to search, but then it seemed there was no more profit in looking for me any longer. And so they went back, boarding their hollow ship again. But it was the gods who concealed me easily, and it was they who brought me here to the steading of an understanding man. So now life is still my portion. Then, O swineherd Eumaeus, you said to him in answer, O sorrowful stranger, truly you troubled the spirit in me by telling me all these details, how you suffered and wandered, yet I think some part is in no true order, and you will not persuade me in your talk about Odysseus. Why is it such a man as you are lie recklessly to me? But I myself know the whole truth of what my Lord's homecoming is, how all the gods hated him so much that they did not make him go down in the land of the Trojans, nor in the arms of his friends, after he had wound up the fighting. So all the Achaeans would have heaped a grave mound over him, and he would have won great fame for himself and his son hereafter. But now, and gloriously, the storm winds have caught and carried him. But I keep away and with my pigs, and I do not go now to the city unless circumspect Penelope, for some reason, asks me to go, when word comes in from one place or another. And there are those who sit beside me and question me over particulars, whether they are grieving for a lord long absence, or are happy at eating up his substance without recompense. But I have no liking for this inquiry and asking of questions, since that time of a Aetolian man beguiled me by telling a story. This one had killed a man and wandered over much country. He came to my house and I entertained him fondly. He said he had seen him with Idomeneus among the Cretan men repairing his ships, for the storm winds had smashed them. And he said he would be coming back in the summer or autumn bringing him many possessions, and with his godlike companions. You too, old man of many sorrows, since the spirit brought you here to me, do not try to please me, nor spell me with lying words. It is not for that I will entertain and befriend you, but for fear of Zeus, the god of guests, and for my own pity. Then, where sorceful Odysseus spoke in turn, and answered him, Truly the mind in you is something very suspicious. Not even with an oath can I bring you round, nor persuade you. Come now. We too shall make an agreement, and for the future the gods who hold Olympus shall be witness to both sides. As your lord makes his homecoming into this, his palace here, you shall give me a tunic and mantle to wear, and send me on my way to Dulucian, where my heart has been desiring to go. But if your lord never comes in the way I tell you, he will set your serving men on me, and throw me over a high cliff, so the next vagabond will be careful and not lie to you. Then, in turn, the glorious swineherd spoke to him and answered, that would be virtuous of me, my friend, and good reputation would be mine among men for present time and alike and hereafter. If first I led you into my shelter, there entertained you as guests, then murdered you and ravished the dear life from you, then cheerfully I could go and pray to Zeus, son of Kronos. But now it is time for our dinner, and I hope my companions come in soon so we can prepare a good dinner here in my shelter. So these two remained conversing this way together, and the sows came up, and with them came the men who were swineherds, and they pinned the sows for the night inside the accustomed places, and an endless clamor went up from the crowding swine. Thereafter the glorious swineherd gave the word to his own companions, Bring in the best of the pigs to sacrifice for our stranger, guests from afar, and we ourselves shall enjoy it. He, we who have long, long, long have endured this wretched work for the pigs with shining teeth, while others at no cost eat up what we have worked on. So he spoke, and with the pitiless bronze split kindling, and the men brought in a pig five years old and a very fat one, and made it stand in front of the fireplace, nor did the swineherd forget the immortal gods, for he had the uses of virtue. 
But he cut off hairs from the head of the white-toothed pig and threw them into the fire as dedication and prayed to all the gods that Odysseus of the many designs should have his homecoming. He hit the beast with a split of an oak that he had lying by him. The breath went out of the pig, then he slaughtered him and singed him, then jointed the carcass, and the swineherd laid pieces of raw meat with offering from all over the body upon the thick fat, and sprinkled these with meal and barley, and threw them in the fire. Then they cut all the remainder into pieces, and spitted them, and roasted all carefully, and took off the pieces, and laid it all together on platters. The swineherd stood up to divide the portions, for he was fair-minded, and separated all the meat into seven portions. One he set aside with a prayer for the nymphs and Hermes, the son of Maia, and the rest he distributed to each man, but gave Odysseus in honor the long cuts of Chine's portion of the white-toothed pig, and so exalted the heart of his master. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke to him and addressed him, I wish, Eumaeus, you could be as dear to our father Zeus as to me, when I am so poor, but you grace me with good things. Then, O swiner Eumaeus, you said to him in answer, Eat, my guest, strange man that you are, and take your pleasure of, of what is here now. The God will give you such, or will let it be as in his own mind he may wish. He can do anything. He spoke and sacrificed first offerings to the immortal gods, then poured bright wine for Odysseus, sacker of cities, and put the cup in his hands, and sat down to his own portion. Mesalios served the bread to them, a man whom the swineherd owned himself by, owned himself, by himself and apart from his absent master and independently of his mistress and the aged Laertes, having bought him from the Tethians with his own possessions. They put forth their hands to the good things <laughs> that lay ready before them. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, Messalios took the food to get away again, and they made haste to go to bed, filled with bread and meat to repletion. A bad night came on, the dark of the moon, and Zeus reigned all night long, and the west wind blew big, always watery. Odysseus spoke among them. He was trying it out on the swineherd to see if he might take off his mantle and give it to him, or tell one of his men to do it, since he cared for him so greatly. Hear me now, Eumaeus, and all you other companions. What I say will be a bit of boasting. The mad, mad wine tells me to do it. Wine sets even a thoughtful man to singing, or sets him into softly laughing, sets him to dancing. Sometimes it tosses out a word that was better unspoken. But now I have broken a loud speech, I will not suppress it. I wish I were young again, and the strength still steady within me, as when, under Troy, we formed an ambush detail and led it. The leaders were Odysseus and Atreus' son, Menelaus, and I made a third leader with them, since they themselves asked me. But when we had come underneath the city and the steep wall, we, all about the city and marshy ground and the dense growth of swamp grass and the reeds, and huddling under our armor, lay there, and a bad night came on with the rush of the north wind freezing, and from above came a fall of snow, chilling like frost, and on the shield's edge the ice form rimming them. There all the other men were wearing both mantles and tunics, and they slept at ease, pulling their great shields over their shoulders. But I, in my carelessness, when I started with my companions, had left my mantle. I never thought I would be so cold, but went along with only my shield and my shining waist guard. But when it was the third time of the night, and after the star changed, then I spoke to Odysseus, for he was lying next to me, nudging him with my elbow, and he listened at once. I said, Son of Laertes, and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, I shall no longer be left among the living. The weather is too much for me. I have no mantle. The spirit made me silly to go half-dressed, and now there is no escape for me. So I spoke, and he immediately had an idea in his mind. Such a man he was for counseling as for fighting. He spoke to me in a little voice and said a word to me. Be quiet now. Let no of the other let no other of the Cations hear you. Then he propped his head on his elbow and spoke a word out loud. Hear me, friends. In my sleep a divine dream came to me. We have come too far away from the ships. Now would there be someone to tell Agamemnon, Atreus' son, shepherd of the people? so he might send more of the men by ships to come here to us? So he spoke, and Thoas sprang up, the son of Andramion, quickly, and took off and laid aside his red mantle, and went on the run for the ships, and I lay down in his clothes happily, and rested until dawn of the golden throne came. 
I wish I were young like that and the strength still steady within me. Some one of the swineherds in his house would give me a mantle, both for love and out of respect for a strong warrior. Now they slight me because I wear vile clothing upon me. Then, O swineherd Emmaus, you said to him in answer, Old sir, that was a blameless fable the way you told it, and you have made no unprofitable speech, nor one that missed the point. So you shall not lack for clothes nor anything rightfully do the unhappy supplant who approaches us. For now that is. You must flaunt your rags again in the morning. There are not many extra mantles and extra tunics here to change into. There is only one set for each man. When, however, the dear son of Odysseus comes back, he will give you a mantle and tunic to wear as clothing, and send you wherever your heart and spirit desire to be sent. So he spoke, and sprang up, and laid a bed for him next to the fire, and threw the fleeces of sheep and goats over it. There Odysseus lay down, and threw over him a mantle that was great and thick, which he kept by him as an extra covering, to wrap in when winter weather came on and was too rigorous. So there, Odysseus went to bed, and the young man beside him lay down also to go to sleep. Only the swineherd did not please to leave his pigs and go to bed indoors, but made preparations as he went out. And Odysseus was happy that his livelihood was so well cared for while he was absent. First, the swineherd slung his sharp sword on his heavy shoulders and put a very thick mantle about him to keep the wind out, and took up also the hairy skin of a great, well-conditioned goat, and took up a sharp javelin as protection against men and dogs, and went to sleep where his pigs, with shining teeth, lay in the hollow of a rock, sheltered from the north wind.